Thanks, son. Amen. Good evening. Good morning. Good morning. We're having communion, and now I'm in the evening mindset. Good to have you all here this morning. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Okay. All right. We're going to have a communion service this morning, so let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn 308. Nothing but the blood, and you may remain seated, uh, and we are going to sing the first two verses of Nothing But the Blood. <clears throat> what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing, this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. It's good to have you here this morning, and we are again having a, a communion service, which we normally do in the evening, and we are once in a while going to do it in the morning uh, for those of you folks that cannot get out to our evening service. And as you know, during our morning service, we are preaching through the book of Philippians, and the text that we are going to be looking at this morning uh, concludes with chapter 3, so I want you to look at the last two verses of chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And we're going to start uh, in a few minutes when we get to this text. We are going to begin in verse 15. And we're going to talk this morning about our walk. Paul uses this word walk uh, throughout this text. And he continues talking about our walk in verse 20, but he he uses a different term, and it's an old English word. We're talking about this in our Bible study just a few minutes ago. Uh, many of you know the King James Version, which is what we use, uh, was written 400 years ago. And uh, we mentioned a book called uh, Authorized by Dr. Mark Ward, and he points out that uh, you know a book that's been written 400 years ago, you have words that are dead words, which means that there's words that are no longer used. And then you have something called false friends, which is there's words that have changed in meaning. 
And there's a word here in verse 20, which would be a false friend. In other words, it's a word that is still in use, but it's changed meaning. And it's the word conversation. We use that word today, don't we? Conversation. I had a conversation the other day. But when they were translating this, this version, uh, it did not mean back then exactly what it means today. So Paul said, for our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation is in heaven. And, and that word back then meant our lifestyle, our conduct of manner. In fact, literally, the Greek word is where we get our English word politics. And it, it literally means our citizenship. And it's our, our, the way we conduct our life. So Paul's saying our citizenship is in heaven from whence we also, also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's been talking and he's talking about how we walk, how we conduct ourselves, how we live our life. And our citizenship is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the way we live our life on this earth is as if our citizenship isn't on this earth. For the Christian, it's really not on this earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. It's as if we're not even citizens of this earth. It's as if we're just strangers passing through because we are. We are temporarily here. We are pilgrims heading home. Now, if you're a born-again believer, that describes you. This world is not my home. There's a song It says, I'm just a passing through. I hope that's the way you view your life. And then here's the culmination in verse 21. Here's what's going to happen to those who are strangers and pilgrims in this world. He will change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You know, this is a great way to describe our current condition. This body is in, we are in the flesh we still have our sinful nature. You realize that? And so Paul says, the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and they are contrary the one to the other. I remember when I got saved, and hopefully you remember this too. I was tired of fighting sin. I knew I was a sinner. That's why I got saved. I knew that I was a wicked sinner. And in fact, I'm always mindful of many of us here uh, one of our church members from, from a few years ago, Bill Fetchick, he moved to Kentucky. Now he's a southerner. But he would always pray this way, and we, we, many of us still pray this way. He would, he would refer to himself and all of us as, you know, he'd say, forgive us dirty, rotten, wretched, filthy sinners. And, um, and I still pray that way because I'm a dirty, rotten, wretched, filthy sinner. Now, if you're offended by that, you know, he was referring to himself, and, and, and many of us were still, I, I'm a dirty, rotten, wretched, filthy sinner, and I hope you see yourself as that. That's why you got saved, right? You, you knew you were a dirty, rotten, wretched, filthy sinner, and that's exactly, look what Paul says. He's going to change our vile body. Now, I have a, a defined study Bible, defined King James Bible, and listen to what the note says under the word vile. Morally base or evil. Wicked, depraved, sinful, repulsive, disgusting, degrading, base. That's not flattering at all. But that's what I am. You say, maybe you shouldn't be a pastor. I'm a sinner, saved by grace, washed in the blood. And I, by the way, I'm not as wicked as I was when I got saved. I'm a lot holier. I'm growing. I am. But deep in my heart, you know, as I grow in Christ, I'm constantly reminded 
that deep inside I'm still that sinner that needed God's grace and salvation. That's why we have communion, because we still need that blood, and, and we still need to, that cleansing of the Lord. That's why we do this. We're going back to Calvary. And so in this walk, this daily walk with the Lord, as we get closer to the Lord, as we get holier, as we become conformed to the image of Christ, we still need that daily cleansing. And so today, we're going to take the juice, which has no magical power. The power is in the blood that was already shed for us. We're just going back to Calvary in our mind. And then when we take the bread, there's no power in this bread. It's just a little wafer, a little flour. But the power was in his broken body. So we're going back to Calvary because that's what accomplished our forgiveness. And we're just praising God for what he did. So first, we're going we're gonna to share together in the juice we're going to thank God for his shed blood, which was already shed by the which will. We, oh, we're going to thank you. I almost went and switched the elements around. We're going to do the bread first. Thank God for his broken body. Then we're going to do the, the juice, which thanks, thanks, thank the Lord for his shed blood. Uh, but by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him. Father, we thank you so much. For your broken body, which you shed on Calvary so long ago, that once for all sacrifice. And Lord, we just thank you that uh, our sins were nailed on him uh, and that that, that that happened once for all. And that we're, not getting, uh, we're not getting our sins forgiven again. It has been put under the blood and our, our sins were nailed to the cross and we were buried with him uh, when he died on the cross, when we got saved, all of our sins were nailed to him. And when he was buried, we were buried with him and risen again. And so, Lord, we're just, we're just praising you for that, renewing our fellowship with you and thanking you for Calvary. And so we ask your blessing today. Father, we thank you. We, we confess sins, things maybe our fellowship has been broken, but certainly we've not lost our salvation we thank you that once we are saved, we are sealed by the Spirit of God. No one can pluck us out of your Father, our Father's hand. And so we rejoice today in Calvary, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll take together the bread. In fact, uh, if anybody needs any of the elements, raise your hand. We have the ushers come. Just raise your hand. And then Ed here. And then line up here. Everybody have one that needs one? Okay, we'll now give you a half an hour to pull them open. And I um, tend to be a creature of habit. I'm going to quote the text from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In the middle of verse 23 is the text I'm most familiar with. <clears throat> and I'm just, we are following the pattern of our Savior on that night when he was with the disciples. That's when he established the ordinance of the Lord's table. And we do that in obedience to the Savior. Everybody ready? Okay, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me.
taking a little extra time for those that came in late. Now, before we share in the juice, let's again go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you are holy. You sit on the throne, exalted. We thank you that in your holiness, you have provided a way for us to enter into your presence so that we have even a chance to approach you And that that way is through the shed blood of our precious Savior. That he has entered into the Holy of Holies. And that, Father, by your blood, by his blood, we have access. And that now we can have our sins forgiven. And that we have an intercessor. And, Father, we forever will praise you. The nail scar hands. And through the blood that we have that access, we praise you forever. Lord, we praise you for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But with the shedding of blood, we have complete forgiveness. And that that's our only hope. And so, Lord, we rejoice today that we are not standing before you robed in our own righteousness but rather the righteousness which is of Jesus Christ. And so we praise you, and we count it a privilege to be able to eat this bread and drink this cup as we have been commanded until we drink it anew with you. And so we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Bible says, After the same manner also our Savior took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. We'll conclude this part of our service by turning again to hymn 308. 308, nothing but the blood. We'll sing the third and the fourth fourth verses right now. Remain seated. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Naught of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand. All right, sticker hymnals. We'll open up to him 353, Victory in Jesus. Hymn 353. The Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. 
I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, and I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. On the last, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there a song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Okay. All right, I'd uh, like to uh, welcome first-time visitors. Uh, just uh, one announcement, our next Finger Food Fellowship panel discussion will be on Sunday, June 30th. Uh, we are welcoming topics and questions for discussion. At this time, I'll have the ushers come forward as we take our general offering. Let's bow for a word of prayer for the offering. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your many blessings, Lord. We thank you for this church. We thank you we can gather together, Lord, and worship and honor you, Lord, without repercussions, Lord. We thank you for this time we take an offering, Lord, to help us to be wise with the funds that you provide, Lord. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Jane. Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We have a lopsided church. <laughs> all right, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to read from verse 15 down to the end of the chapter. And then we'll remain standing for prayer. Philippians chapter 3, beginning of verse 15. <clears throat> Philippians uh, chapter 3, beginning of verse 15, the Bible says, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven." From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto this glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. May God bless his word. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you for the promises that are in this, in this text today. We thank you for the hope of the resurrection. We thank you for the promises and what we have to look forward to. And Father, we pray that you would help us in this earthly journey. Help us to keep on keeping on. Help us to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling, our high calling in you. Father, I pray that wherever we are in this journey, that we would never quit, that we would understand what's at stake, that we would recognize all the pitfalls that are along the way, and that we would realize that whatever uh, suffering there is in this present world, that it truly will, will not be worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us when we get to heaven. And Father, maybe there's some that uh, are not ready. Uh, they've not entered this race uh, because they're not ready for eternity. They've not entered the race. They're not saved. And we pray, Father, that today they would recognize their need to prepare for eternity, that they would hear the gospel, that they would be saved. And, Lord, we just ask that you would get the glory today. Bless, feed the flock, challenge the lost, and just be glorified in everything. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And you may be seated. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. He, sister and my God, assist me to proclaim through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name jesus the name that charms our fears that bids our sorrow cease tis music in the sinner's ears tis life and health and peace him ye his praise ye dumb your loosened tongues employ tis music in and leap ye lame for joy. 
He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoners free. His blood can make the phallus clean. His blood availed for me. Thanks, Dave. All right, good to have you here. Thank you for coming today. Let's open our Bibles to Philippians. 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 Sounds weird just saying that. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And I want to remind you that we're still taking questions. We do have one or two carryover questions for our next panel discussion. But I want to say I was blessed. Our last panel discussion was on Easter. And I thought we weren't going to have anybody stick around. And we had a good group of people. Um, so what we do is the, it's, it's on the, when we have a fifth Sunday of the month, uh, we are having a, a, like a light luncheon after the morning service. And then we're, instead of doing an evening service, we have like an afternoon panel discussion and then we end it for the day. So we have our morning services, then we have a luncheon, and then we have a panel discussion with the deacons and pastoral staff. Uh, and it's been a real blessing. Uh, we, we take your questions and then we open it up for follow up and stuff. And it's been a real blessing. So we're going to do that again, uh, again on um, June 30th. So uh, just see me or one of the deacons hand a question if you have any questions. Anything's fair game, but we do like a heads up so we can study it. Some, you know, you folks have some good questions. You really do. And we don't, you know, if it's really difficult and you stump us, we'd at least like a heads up to dig into it and study it. This lady right here has some really Tough questions. I'm pointing at you, Jane. You know, she really has some tough questions, but at least she gives us a heads up. Um, not that we always have the right answer, but we do our best. All right, Philippians chapter 3, we're digging in. Um, last Sunday and then on March 3rd, the text that we were looking at last Sunday was Philippians 3, verses 10 through 14. And then on March 3rd, we looked at chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. And the theme that Paul was addressing, he was addressing the idea that the Christian life is a race. And that's a common theme in the New Testament by Paul and some others. Uh, listen to some of these verses. For example, last week, Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, here's another verse in Scripture, the New Testament. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. 1 Corinthians, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And Paul said, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. And then another verse, Paul says, I went up by revelation lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. And then he tells the Galatians, he said, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? So the Christian life is likened to a race and that we are to forget those things which are behind and look forth and reach for the prize. Are you running the Christian race? Have you set aside those things which can easily beset us? You know, there's a lot of Christians that have allowed themselves to just kind of have setbacks. They've, they've stopped running the race. Well, today, we're seeing a, a different metaphor for the Christian life. And instead of a race, it is looked at as a long journey, where it's instead of running the race, we are walking this journey. And instead of a, a marathon or a sprint, this is a long journey, and we're talking about the Pilgrim's Progress. You ever heard of that? There was a great work, a classic book written by John Bunyan called Pilgrim's Progress. And that's what I've titled the message today. Just looking at the text, our text today, uh, notice Paul uses this idea of walking, that the Christian life is a journey. So we're going to use that theme. Look, look at the verses here. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 16. 
Paul says, Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as you have us for an ensample. And then verse 18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often. And then we already saw verse 20, Our conversation, that is our manner of life. So Paul talks about the Christian life as a journey. But I want to share you something. I want to share for those of you that have never heard of Pilgrim's Progress. It was written by a man who lived in the 17th century. His name was John Bunyan. He was a Baptist preacher. And Charles Spurgeon said of Bunyan, he said, if you prick him, he bleeds Bible. And that's true because if you ever read Pilgrim's Progress, it's like, Every verse that comes out, I mean, everything that he writes, it's just the, the man was so saturated with the Bible. And one Christian publisher described the book Pilgrim's Progress this way. Bunyan turned the Christian life with all its struggles and its victories into a romantic quest through a strange land. A man called Christian flees the city of destruction and journeys to the celestial city. Along the way, he meets such memorable obstacles and characters as the slough of despond. The word slough is like a marsh or a deep, muddy pit. Mr. Worldly Wise Man, Apollyon, the valley of the shadow of death, Vanity Fair, giant despair, and finally the river of death. Written in the English of the laborer, and the common tradesman, and never since out of print. This classic is a best-selling adventure that continues to delight children and adults century, centuries later. So Paul talks about walking, and he uses the idea of walking in a figurative sense. Walking can speak of the manner of conducting yourself or your behavior. And that's what Paul's talking about. And so if you are a Christian, you are walking this life. You are living the Christian life. And so Paul talks about the Christian life. So let's look at what Paul has to say about how we conduct ourselves on this long journey called the Christian faith. Beginning in verse 15, he says, Let us therefore... As many as be perfect. What's he talking about? Well, let's I remind you of what he had just said. He's going back to, uh, and he, in fact, when he says as many as be perfect, it's a play on words going back to verse 12. Look at verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. He's talking about his Christian life. And he's saying, I have not arrived. Um, you know, he's talking about he is, he is seeking, he's striving for the finish line, striving for the prize, and he, he says, I have not attained, I'm not, not, I haven't arrived. He's seeking for the finish line. And so he's let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, or in other words, as many as are maturing or growing, he says, let us be thus minded. And that little phrase is referring to everything he's been talking about. Chapters 2, chapters 3, and I remind you, let's kind of go back here, because he's talking about, he's already been challenging them. Go back to chapter 2, he says, in verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And then in verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3, look what he says. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but... In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. He's talking about being selfless. He's talking about putting others first. And that's his theme the whole time. And then he gives us the greatest example. Jesus Christ. He's saying, be like Jesus, 
who humbled himself and became obedient unto death. There's nobody greater in humility than Jesus Christ. And then he talked about Timothy and how nobody cared for other people as much as Timothy. And then he talked about Epaphroditus and how he almost, he almost died caring for others. So he's been talking all about not being selfish. And now he's, and he's talking about growing in the Lord. And he's challenging them about being the same way. And then, so he's talking about, in fact, look at verse, um, now look at verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. So he's saying, be humble. You also be selfless. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. In other words, if there's an area, as you grow in the Christian life, if you see some area where you're being selfish, God's going to show it to you. And God is so faithful to do that. We just had communion. What a perfect opportunity. Communion is designed by God for us to examine ourselves. By the way, you know one of the greatest ways you can examine yourself other than communion, the Holy Spirit? God will use people. It's called iron sharpening iron. The Bible says, as iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. You know what happens when two swords clank together? There's friction. Sparks. Like when you sharpen a, you know, a sword. You know what happens when two people clash together? It's one of the best ways to refine your character. And yet so many Christians look at it as just the opposite. We look at it as, oh man, I, I don't want to be around that person. I'm always clashing with them. What an opportunity. Are you married? You know the Bible says this about marriage? Paul gives, gives these examples in marriage about um, you know, different scenarios. And he says, if people, two people decide to get married, he says, nevertheless, such. It's like, okay, if you decide to get married, such shall have trouble in the flesh. You want to get married? Okay, I'm warning you. You're going to have problems. Oh, great. Now he tells us. In other words, you want to, you want to live with people? There's going to be some clashing going on. I would say the same thing. You want to be involved in a church? You want to? Guess what? There's going to be some clashing going on. You know, there's some people that they, don't, they, don't, they won't get involved in a church. I don't need a church. It's just me and my Bible. Just me and Jesus. You miss that. You go to a church. There's going to be some clashing going on. Hey, God, God starts us all out in a family. Guess what happens in a family? There's some clashing that goes on. God designs that. That's how God molds you. Now, when you get saved, God designs people to grow you. Iron sharpening iron. And if you're not growing through the Iron sharpening iron. You're not growing in humility. Then you're missing something. And God's going to reveal it to you if you allow Him to do that. God will reveal it to you if you keep walking the walk. Are you walking the walk? Are you on this journey? Are you, are you pilgrim? By the way, in Pilgrim's Progress, along the way, Pilgrim would meet people. First, he met faithful and he walked with faithful through all these obstacles. And then at one point, God called faithful home. He went to the celestial city early. And then along the way, he met another Christian called hopeful. And so along your Christian life, God's going to put other people in your, in your walk. But the key is that you are progressing. It's called pilgrim's progress. First of all, are you a pilgrim? Have you, have you become a Christian? Christian is the pilgrim. Next, look at verse 16 through 19. We need to be solid in our forward progression. Paul says, nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained. 
Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. In other words, we need to keep walking in step with the same standard. We need to keep progressing is the idea. Verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. You know, when you and I are growing in the Christian life, we will find out that there are people, Christians, who we can pattern our life after. There, there are testimonies of people that we can emulate, godly people like Paul. And we can follow their example and look for others who pattern their life after other godly Christians. What did Jesus say? You shall know them by their fruit. We need to constantly be fruit inspecting. You know that? Because there's a lot of people that talk the talk but don't walk the walk. There's people that talk about what great parents they are or great husbands or wives they are. And yet, you know, it's easy to say, I'm a great husband. And then you look at the wife and she's not too happy. Right? Or it's great to say, I am such a great dad. And the kids are rolling their eyes, right? I love when I see a dad or a mom connecting with their kids. They love their kids, their kids love them. That's awesome. Not that there's not conflict. I mean, human relationships are sinners with sinners, right? But Paul is saying, you know, relationship. Look for fruits. And then... As far as examples go, forward progression, he says in verse 18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. These are people who their God is their appetite, and they are living, and they're minding earthly things. I want to talk about John Bunyan for a minute. Pilgrim's Progress. That's what this is all about. Walk in the Christian life. It is is a, a race, but it's also a long journey. And I want to talk to you one of the one of the things about Pilgrim's Progress and this figurative imaginary place on the way to the celestial city. There is a place called the Slough of Despond. It is like this big pit. And I want to read to you just an excerpt from Pilgrim's Progress that John Bunyan wrote when he was in prison. Now this is not Old English. This is early modern English, which is what the King James was written in. So it's a little difficult, but listen to this part. As Christian meets up with a friend called Pliable. Listen to the story. Now I saw in my dream that just as they had ended this talk, they drew near to a very miry slough uh, that was in the midst of the plain. And they, being heedless, did both fall suddenly into the bog. The name of the slough was Despond. Here, therefore, they wallowed for a time, being grievously grievously debawed with the dirt. And Christian, because of the burden that was on his back, began to sink in the mire. Then said Pliable, Ah, neighbor Christian, where are you now? Christian truly said, Christian, I do not know. At that, Pliable began to be offended and angrily said to his fellow, Is this the happiness you've told me all this while? If we have such ill speed at our first setting out, what may we expect twixt this and our end, our journey's end? If I get out again with my life, you shall possess the brave country alone. And with, what, and with that he gave a desperate struggle or two and got, got out of the mire on that side of the slough, which was next to his own house. So away he went and Christian saw him no more. There will be friends like Pliable, who will walk with you for a little while, but when things get tough, they don't want anything more with the Christian faith. Just what Jesus predicted in Matthew chapter 12 
and the sower in the soil. Wherefore, Christian was left to tumble in the slough of despond alone. But still he endeavored to struggle to that side of the slough that was farthest from his own house, and next to the wicket gate which he did but could not get out because of the burden that was upon his back. But I beheld in my dream that a man came to him whose name was Help and asked him what he did there. Christians, and, and sir, said Christian, I was bidden to go this way by a man called Evangelist who directed me also to yonder gate that I might escape the wrath to come. And as I was going hither, I fell in here. But why did you not look for the steps? Christian uh, said, fear followed me so hard that I fled the next way and fell in. Then said he, give me thy hand. So he gave me his hand and he drew him out and set him upon some ground and bade him go away, go his way. You know, there's going to be times, folks, when you and I go through the slough of despond. And then sometimes you and I might have to go in it alone. And like Paul said, there will be people who are enemies of the cross of Christ. And Paul, when he said it, was weeping. And so, we get to verse 20 and 21. Paul said, for our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. In this Christian life, you and I have to understand, this is not the end. This is the walk whereby God is growing us. And what you and I are, because we are citizens, not of this earth, we are citizens of heaven. It is important that we keep our eyes on the prize. Remember what Paul had just said to them. Forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forth unto those things which are before. Remember, he was already apprehended of Christ, but he had not finished the race. So I've been thinking of this slough of despond. And I remember that John Bunyan wrote this when he was in prison. I want to share with you some things about John Bunyan. I want to read to you a couple things as we finish up here. John Bunyan was in prison from 1661 to 1672. And by the way, let me just read to you some of the things that, that happened. During that time, he wrote 12 books, some of which had their origin in his prison sermons. His most famous book of all was Grace Abounding. Uh, then released, he was released for prison, and he wrote further seven books. By the way, this man had little education. He was in Oliver Cromwell's army for a while, uh, and that's uh, some, uh, somebody that wrote about him said that's where he, he was in school under some very great preachers during that army. That was when he went to school under those preachers. And then he went to university by being in prison. Like that was his education. But he wrote profoundly. And the man knew his Bible. He had the King James, the authorized version, and he had the Geneva Bible. And he was, it was like he just ate, drank, and slept, both of them. And um, of, of his many, many years in prison... He was tormented, but he didn't have to go to prison. He was given the opportunity many times to be released. Now, John Bunyan was married, and we don't know what his first wife's name, but he had four children with his first wife, and then she died. And then soon after that, he married his second wife, and he had, a, I think, two children with her. One of his children was blind. And he had several opportunities where he could have recanted he could have said i will not preach anymore i won't preach the gospel and he would have been released but he refused to do that and so he sat in the prison and i just imagine that these things that came out of him in pilgrim's progress imagine he's writing about the slough of despond when he's in prison and he struggled with doubts Listen to what he wrote. Because he had times when he wavered on whether he should have stayed there. Listen to what he wrote. During one of the times of torment, 
And maybe this is, you know, out of this came this, uh, some of these illusions of the plow of dis- or the, the slough of despond. He said, the parting with my wife and poor children hath often been to me in this place as the pulling of the flesh from my bones. And that not only because I am somewhat too fond of these great mercies, but also because I should have often brought to my mind the many hardships, miseries, and wants that my poor family was like to meet with should I be taken from them especially my poor blind child who lay nearer my heart than all I had besides. Oh, the thoughts of the hardship I thought my blind one might go under would break my heart to pieces. Anyone that's a parent can know. I I just, I cannot imagine. This ripped him apart knowing that he's thinking, I could be out of here and with my children helping my little girl. No wonder he wrote from the depths of despair, this plow of despond, this uh, slough. He was was in the miry clay when he wrote these great works. This man, and I submit to you, he was on Pilgrim's Progress when he was in jail. He was walking the walk. Are you walking the walk? I hope you are. I shared on Wednesday night, I um, heard a pastor giving some counsel that blessed my heart. And, and I needed to hear this counsel. A Christian had asked a question of this pastor. The Christian said, I am the, I am the only Christian in my whole biological family. He said, how do I not despair at the fact that they're all headed to hell as it stands? He said, it's leading me to doubt the goodness of God. And this pastor took that very seriously. He hesitated. You could tell he's starting to get emotional because he said, I was in that same situation. And he said, and I'm not taking your question lightly. And he said, with great sincerity, he said, The counsel that I'm going to give you is to just wait. And then he took them to to Revelation chapter 19. And in Revelation chapter 19, you have the setting of the judgment of God where all people are standing before the throne of God. And he painted this picture. He said, we're going to be there. And he said, we are going to get to witness the God, omnipotent God, the creator of the world in his holiness. And we are going to see him judging righteous judgment. And and God is right. His judgments are right and true. And in that context... We are going to see Him judge. And when you read Revelation chapter 19, we are going to worship Him in that context. And this pastor said, you don't yet understand the goodness of God in relation to sin and His judgment of sinners. You don't yet understand that. But you will. You just have to wait. Man, that was good. I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that. Because I don't always understand. But I know that when I see God in His holiness, and I'm going to see that, I'm going to say, it's right. It's right. God does right. He judges right. You know, First Peter... Chapter 1, I've shared this with, with our folks. And I shared this on a Sunday too, just, just after that Wednesday. First Peter 1 and 8, verse 8, the Bible says, it talks about our inheritance, which was reserved in heaven. It's, it's, it's guaranteed. And it says this, Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. On this side of heaven, 
It's hard to walk by faith. But when we see Him, it will be worth it all. And you and I will know it was right. It was right. So Christian, are you in the journey? Are you walking with the Lord? Remember Hebrews chapter 12? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience. Or can I, in this context, let's get back on the journey. Let's walk the walk. Let's get on the journey. Maybe you become like pliable and you've given up. You're on your own, Christian. Let's be like faithful. Let's be like hopeful. Let's get back on the journey. Don't let some professing Christian, don't let someone else stop you from fighting the good fight, from walking this journey. Because folks, in the end, it will be worth it all. Let's pray. Father, help us. There's just too many casualties along the Christian route. And I pray, Father, that we would no longer doubt your goodness. I pray, Father, that we would be those pilgrims progressing, that we would be pilgrims progressing in this journey. And Father, for those that may be listening, maybe they stopped going to church, maybe they gave up, maybe they're bitter. They've, they've cast aside. They've given up. Lord, get them back in the race. Get them back on their journey. Help them not to end badly. Help them to end well. Get them back on the road, Lord. Help us to, to just get back in it. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please let's stand and we will close in song.